before we start the show, I want to do a little seriousness. Um, friend of the show, person I've interviewed, and the creator of Legend of the Robo Vikings, Jeremy Rathbone, his wife has contracted cancer. It's stage four cancer, and he has put up a GoFundMe page. It's GoFundMe slash F8 ref 3 hw If you have some spare cash, if you want to help out a friend, please go to that page and contribute. They're looking to pay some expenses. They need a little help. And they're friends of the show. So if you're a friend of the show, help out some other friends of the show. And now, on with the silliness. Believe it or not, there's dino porn in this episode. and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rat Bastard. Where are the girls called cookies? And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires we call the Internet is Joe Crazy Rider. How you doing Where today, Joe? Where are our girls called cookies? You already ate them all, Joe. Leo got them at the Oscars last night. Where are ours? Corey, if they can at least provide Girl Scout cookies to the... Oscar winner for best male actor, you could at least get me and Jen some Girl Scout cookies. Now, now, now why would I do that? I don't need any more cookies. Cold First cookies. off, I, I wasn't even nominated for an Oscar. You were, but it was one of those little technical categories that nobody really gives a crap about. So no, I, 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 no, I wasn't invited to the Oscars no, either. They don't want you. Much like Jada Pickett-Smith, and for the same reason, neither one of us are actors. I don't know about Girl Scout cookies. No one knocks on my door to sell me anything anymore since I scared off the Mormons. Jeez, you sound like Trump talking about the KKK. I think he's sitting on a batch of Thin Mints he's not willing to share with us. I you hear are... Mad Max won some things. Yeah, he yes. won almost everything <laughs> except Best Picture. Yes, uh, Mad Max won a whole bunch of awards, and uh, I, I didn't watch a minute of the Oscars. You know, and the sad thing is, I think it's an age thing, because Chris and I, normally Sunday's our family day, and we, we were kind of like, I don't want to do anything. I don't know, let's go out to eat. I don't want to go out to eat. Should we have something sent in? I don't want to do that. <laughs> what are we going to do? Uh, let's turn on the Oscars. So we watched, I actually had the Oscars on. At, while I was doing that, I kind of, flip through my previews, you know, just so at least I was accomplishing something in the four-hour ceremony. I was real curious, though, to see what Chris Rock would have to say because of the whole controversy going on. And he was Chris Rock. He just took that elephant in the room and turned it into an ivory-handled uh, bracelet for him. You know, he just – the best thing was, as he said, you know, Hollywood racism isn't, you know, burning cross racism. It's not – you know, that type of racism. It's more like a, a sorority racism. You know, you we like you, but you're beta kappa, so you can't be with us. You know, that type of thing. And again, I'm paraphrasing at the best, but I mean, I listened to it. It was it was fun. I thought it was pretty cool. And the one thing that I thought was really cool, the the one thing that caught right away is that they did the little banner across the bottom for everybody that you wanted to like. And not that it stopped people from, you know, naming off a bunch of people anyways. When, that would be something on my bucket list. If one of you guys win an Oscar, just yell out, and crazy for you, crazy. Just one. <laughs> you know, I think that would Why be Why would I win an Oscar? No, if, it's an if, you know. I might be Pope, too. It could happen. I'm just saying. And I liked when a box appeared telling you who the actor was that was giving the presentation because – 99 times out of 99, I didn't know who it was. Or if it was someone I probably know, I didn't recognize the way they were get up. But the coolest thing at the Oscars, and I would love if they did this in the movies, when they went to Best Screenplay, they had, you know, the actual 
screenplay and it faded into the movie and then they would read the screenplay along and you'd watch the actor acting and then of course it would break then he you know the actor says this and then the screenplay there's a reaction they look kind of disappointed what a great way to watch a movie to have like a screenplay running behind the scenes and then seeing how the actor interprets that on the on the the screen i think that should be something in a in a blu-ray but no one listens to me anyway, so. Uh, did did The Hateful Eight win Best Picture? Uh, no. Then I could not possibly care less. Oh, actually, what won Best Picture? I don't even know. Yeah, it wasn't The Hateful Eight, so I don't care. Um, well, if it was Mad Max, you would have cared. It wasn't Mad Max, though, was oh, I know, it? I know it wasn't. But we're not here to talk about movies and awards and ceremonies and and, and cookies. Why not? We we talk about all sorts of crap. We're here to talk about funny books. It was a a one about the the church uh, sex scandal thing. I was thinking it was Bridge of Spies. You you keep calling them that, but these books you give me aren't very funny. (laughs) I would enjoy them a lot more if they were. I thought the last one we did was pretty good. Well, Batgirl... Was that it? That yeah, girl was good, good but it's still like I don't know. It wasn't. It wasn't. And then funny. the X Files. That was okay, not the funny. Wasn't so funny. And then the one we did this week, Paleo. No, okay, Paleo. That, Paleo. that is not funny. Thing. This week or this month's previews has a how to read X Files. So as you're going through like season ten, you know which ones to read as it breaks off in the miniseries. I got to give kudos to IDW because they do that with all their lines whether it's uh, Ghostbusters or, in this case, X-Files. So if you are going to pick up a book, you know at least where to start. Or if you're picking up a book in the middle, you know where you are in the storyline. So I think that's kind of cool, especially if you're going to keep going with sequential stuff. And they kind of have to go with miniseries because they need that number one bump. But we'll talk about that after we do our weekly review. Our weekly review this time was a comic called Paleo, Created by, Jim Larson. by the popular Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle artist. The groundbreaking paleo series accurately depicts the hair-raising violence and drama of dinosaur life in the late Cretaceous period. Where are the collection feathers? Includes this, actually, i got a comment about that later. But the collection includes the six original ser- uh, books, comics, and two new issues. The Paleo Tales of the Late Cretaceous, as well as a selection of brand new tales inked by Larson and written by uh, somebody we've talked about in the past, Stephen Bissett, who had his own, uh, he, he contributed a, uh, an extensive history of dinosaur comics, including his own Tyrant comic, which I thought was, uh, well, we've talked about Tyrant in the past. You know, he didn't really get into why it quit, but. Uh, oh, I know why it quit. Oh, yeah, we talked about that. Go ahead, give, give the quick version. Well, first let's do the review, and then we'll talk more about other other stuff. Um, Joe, first off, I did not know this comic existed. I guess it came out as monthly issues back in 2001, 2002, and then sporadically until about 2004 when it ended. But first, Joe, reading the trade paperback, what did you think? It's by Dover Publications, first, in case you're looking for it. I found it fascinating. I mean, I thought it was kind of cool. I said the first part, I, I skipped over the first part of the, the dinosaur history by Stephen Bissett. And I found that actually more interesting than anything else. To me, this is something like you, Corey, would, would dig because it's talking about all the different dinosaur comics, you know, whether it's Turok to his own Tyrant to yeah, Age of Reptiles from Dark Horse. But this is basically a 300 page dinosaur action graphic novel. I found the story and the art very good. Uh, The art was incredible. Uh, It was laid out well. Peter Lard, is that how you say his name? Laird. Laird. He added lettering along, which just enough, for most parts, times it got a little bit too much, just enough lettering to move the story along. Most of the time you could just watch the action. There were a few times I had to kind of go, you're kind of making it for a human. But for the most part, this is what dinosaur life may have been like way back then, 270 million years ago. It, it seemed, the interesting thing as I'm, I'm reading, and I think it included eight different 
six or eight different uh, stories from the comics, six original and two new issues. When you're reading each book, it seems like you want to root for the first dinosaur that appears, whether it's the young female Triceratops in book one, the lone Alamosaur in book eight, or the old Albertsaur in, in book five. I found it just good reading. You know, I mean, I enjoyed it a little. You know, I, I don't know. You can read it as fast as you want because a lot of it's action in the art. And then the words like bring it along. But I found this quite enjoyable. I definitely would recommend it for anybody who's a dinosaur lover or an eight-year-old kid. Or yeah, I was going to say, kid. <laughs> kid me would have totally dug this. Now, the one thing which you mentioned earlier, Jen, you know, like where's the feathers? It'll be interesting years from now to look back at this book and realize, oh, man, he was so off on dinosaurs as they discover more and more about him. I mean, I look back at the old Land of the Lost live action show in the 70s and, you know, the dinosaurs that they played with, well, they would have been toast had they met the Jurassic Park dinosaurs. And even now we realize the Jurassic Park dinosaurs aren't necessarily the way they really were. They just are the way we like, we like our dinosaurs, gray and grumpy. Jen, what was your opinion of the book? I like it. Um, the art is phenomenal, though. I really kind of kind of looking through everything. I'm just kind of uh, overwhelmed by the urge to take a set of markers and start coloring this <laughs> shit. Coloring book too. It looks it looks a lot like the adult coloring books that are popular right now. There's a lot of hatching and nice line work and dark areas, but there's also a lot of white space that would lend this to uh, being colored very nicely. So. But some of this is just amazing. I'm looking right now at some pages with a dragonfly. Oh yeah. And just the, the, the this is just incredible. The the stippling and the hatching in here and, and just the, the level of detail. Um, you know, I feel like now, it was those... accidentally trying to teach me something, so <laughs> minus a point for that. But like I said, when I was a kid I would have totally dug this. I'm not so much into, you know, dinosaurs these days and I'm more like I like the giant chickens that we have now. Now, for people who don't know as much about art as you do, you talked about stippling and hatching. Could you explain what that is to people who don't have as much art knowledge? Uh, stippling is tiny dots, and hatching is tiny lines. And what do you what? Why would you use one instead of the other? Uh, different artists use them differently. You know, I mean, everybody's got their own kind of unique toolbox that they develop over time, but. Mainly, I see its use here is kind of how I use it. It just creates texture. So, you know, the dinosaurs are primarily hatched, so you kind of get that more reptilian feel of their skin, and there's some different textures and like, the tree trunks, and, and the insects are are kind of mostly stippled to kind of give them a more more rounded effect, I guess. You know, and there's there's a good mix of a lot of different kinds of techniques in here, but it's really just really well done except for the no feathers. Well, it is, it is from, what, the first issue was put out in 2001. So I think we have to give a little, yeah, we have to give a little leeway for the fact that the feathers are really kind of new-ish. Well, you know, I mean, I'm just being silly, but I, I've seen so much, like, great art of these, like, giant chickens that, you know, I'm disappointed when they look, you know, more like, you know, the little rubber toys I had when I was a kid. <laughs> um, for me, first off, I did not know that this comic existed back in 2001, 2002, and I probably would have bought it because I was such a huge fan of Age of Reptiles and the aforementioned Tyrant. I think this is a very rich vein for artists to not just tell you know, good stories, but to show off their art skills. And Jim Larson was an artist who I kind of remembered from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but he didn't really impress me, and it was during the time period when I was losing interest in the Turtles comic. So seeing his art here was kind of blew me away at the level of detail and, and the mastery of the form that he had. I also liked that the page layouts were big. 
you had m two or three panels a page to give it that that big expansive feel. It's very easy to read too. And that the other thing that kind of jumped out at me is we talk about all ages comics, and usually when you say the phrase all ages comics, people go, oh, you know, kids books. Richie Rich. I think this is a book that kids would enjoy. Teenagers might enjoy it if they, you know, depending on their attitude and everything. But then myself as an adult, I really enjoyed the fact that it, as Jen said, it's trying to educate you, but it did it in an entertaining Dude, way. I don't know. On page 263, it's getting a little raunchy here. <laughs> These uh, dinosaurs are, like, sniffing each other. Never mind. Go on. <laughs> His heart races. Uh, what does it say? Wait, 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 wait. Where does it come back? His heart races. He betrays nothing. Instinct and fleeting experience asserts an uncanny discipline upon both. <laughs> <laughs> the dance. She responds as he expected and hoped for. Without hesitation, he responds, repeats the Typical step. bar night. Yeah. I don't see much difference from that from when they show mating rituals in other nature films. The dance lasts for much of the morning, each keeping a cautious distance that narrows and gives way to the next page. Oh, don't give it away. I, I'm not... And then they fucked. Mommy, what? to cover your cover your cover your child's eyes on page. What are they doing? Page, page two sixty five. The there. I imagine that was written by Stephen Bissett. <laughs> she shudders in anticipation. She will be his. I'm not making this up. I'm reading this straight off the dinosaur. I'm going to go pull out my. I did not make it that far. Her musk oh, fills the air like pollen. He seeks access. This is dirty. Okay. This yeah, is dirty. Is this is the X-rated tag on on iTunes. But I was very impressed with this book. And the other thing is, it's a twenty dollar book, and it's huge. It's almost three hundred pages. And there ain't many of them on eBay. I'll do the auto audio book. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd buy Sexy for that. Sexy Dino Comics, read by Jim. <laughs> there you go. Now there's a podcast. <laughs> uh, the other thing the that Joe pointed out. Excites him anew. Go on. The other thing that Joe no, pointed no, go out. Go back is, to Jim. Keep going. Did seriously, just use the word dank. Oh my god. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty dank back in that time. Dude, there's like they're like got their head thrown back in like this Dinosaur like moment of ecstasy, ecstasy, and you can't see like what's going on. It's kind of slightly off panel. Oh, kind of like the Brady Bunch was. Oh, God. What are you trying to talk about, Corey? I'm stuck on Dino Six. I was going to say the part that Joe talked about, I was fascinated by, and I eventually had to stop reading it so I could read the comic because I only had so much time this weekend to, to read. But Bissette goes into the history of dinosaur comics, and it that is an essay that's worth its weight in gold to me. Um, I highly recommend this book if you're at all interested in dinosaurs, or also if you're interested in really good natural, I want to call it like natural history art. Because this it's well-researched, well-laid out, easy to read, very easy to read. If you're not a regular comic reader, it the, the art pulls you along through the story. And as Joe said, in my mind, the mark of a good artist is if you can tell, if you can read the story without looking at any of the captions. And in all of these stories, I was able to follow what was going on. And in some cases, I would have to go back to read the captions because I was so captivated by the art. Um, I'm also glad that it sounds like that this comic kind of went away due to low sales. But this trade paperback is going to get it to a new audience and has a bunch of unfinished stories got completed and put in. Um, highly recommended. Uh, Joe, buy, borrow, or ignore? I would borrow it for me. I would definitely buy it if you have uh, someone who's a dinosaur fan, fanatic, freak. Jen? Uh, you should definitely buy this and and unknowingly give your, your children a kind of a dinosaur fetish they're going to live out when they're older. 
<laughs> Put on the Velociraptor costume. too. <laughs> I love it when you wear that rubber mask. <laughs> and the first kinky. <laughs> it's just a giant chicken costume. <laughs> For me, this is a buy as well, and you know, e- the art is easily the selling point. After reading this, I now am going to go looking for other Jim Larson work because it's very easy for me to tell that from his Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle days to this, he really matured as an artist. He really grew and really understands not just how to how to draw a page, but also how to use the art to to tell a story, which is what I'm always looking for in a comic book artist. You could be a great artist and not be a great comic book artist. And Jim Larson is both. A whole bunch of news has been dropping. News. News. Whatever. Whatever. Um, the, Whatever. The first, the first one. Deadpool's uh, coming out in a rated X version. Seriously? Oh, yeah, that's what they say. Well, I'm just going to wait and watch R. that one then. Oh. That should be pretty cool. They're also talking like when they finally come out with Batman and Superman on DVD, it'll probably be rated R. Yeah, that's what we need. We need a Superman movie that children can't see. No, it's not in the theater. That's still going to be. I don't care. The only people that would like Superman. See, that's the problem, what you don't realize. Well, you might, Corey. Comic book (laughs) art is really violent when you put it to another media. Remember when X-Men cartoon came out? People are like, oh my, this is too violent for kids. And we're looking at it like, no, this is actually kind of laid back compared to what we look at in comic books. So, yeah, anytime you try to do that, you're going to have to cut it back. So, yeah, a decent fist of fight between them, just like in the original Dark Knight, yeah, it's probably rated R if you put it on screen. I, I I will say this over and over, and I don't care who disagrees with me. You should not have Superman, the character Superman, in something that children can't see. I also don't think that you know, Batman has gotten very dark, and I understand that. Batman! But I don't think Batman should be in R-rated movies either, because children are predisposed to want to see Batman. Now, I want, I, want you to children. I want you to quantify, yes, qualify, you are a children. qualify what you consider children. Um, I, I don't think you should have an R-rated oh, no. what, mainstream. What's a child to you? Okay, um, eight and up. Okay. What is it if you're younger See, than eight? If you're younger than eight, then... You know, that's the parents' discretion as to whether you could see violence, because I know parents who felt that the Batman animated series was too violent. What? And, and in ratings, some of the episodes were rated Y8. Yeah, they actually came out with warnings saying, I might not let your kids watch this. And Our I didn't. Because not. it's not for four-year-olds. Hey, why are you posting on Twitter while you're recording a podcast? Um, why am I retweeting you- this while you're recording a podcast? YouTube does that automatically when they are done um, taking care YouTube. of all the processing. Yes, the YouTubes. The YouTube. The YouTubes, where, you know, I, I take the video and I put it on a truck. It's like on the back of a truck. And it's shoved into the YouTube. I see that. It's like Joe and I have had this discussion before about Spider-Man. There was a Spider-Man story called The Other. Spider-Man. And in the Spider-Man story, he was possessed by... I, I've read the story five times. I still don't understand what the hell happened. But Spider-Man ate a guy's head. And it what? was delicious. And I'm sorry, Spider-Man should not be a character who, ki- who, 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 who kills and eats people. Spider-Man stops feeling sorry for himself long enough to do anything? Uh, he was possessed by some evil spider totem thing that changed him, and then he had organic web spinners like like in the movies, and they they got rid of it eventually. But I don't want a Spider-Man story where he's killing and eating people. I don't want a Spider-Man story, and this happened, I swear to God, where his radioactive sperm gives his wife cancer. Yet some That's people may want those stories. You keep not calling these funny books, but there's nothing <laughs> funny about cancer. There's nothing funny about radioactive. Do you realize, Corey, if we had a superhero named the Blue Whale, when he ejaculates, 40 gallons of sperm would come out of him? 
And, and that's why there's no superhero called the Blue Whale outside of maybe an issue of Wendy Whitebread Undercover Slot. Wow. We got another dirty episode, and we're reviewing a dinosaur <laughs> comic. Who'd have thought? <laughs> Me and Joe are but, on a roll tonight. But the problem is Deadpool made a, 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 a huge mound of money. And it sounds like everybody's learning the wrong lesson. The lesson isn't, ooh, let's have superheroes have sex and curse. It's, no, you make the character like in the comic, and people will enjoy it. More full frontal nudity. (sighs) Can can the two of you go to your computer right now? I am sitting in front of my computer. Put in the website, darkhallmansion.com. Do I have to put on pants? No, it won't watch you. Is this kind of an interactive one, so all our readers uh, can do this? All the, the readers time? should do it, too. What am I Listen, looking at? Listeners. Okay. What have you tricked no. me into looking at? Now I want you to click is on... Is pornography blog. here? No, there's no pornography here. Click on blog. Uh-huh. It's still loading. My internet's faster. Suck it, Joe. Okay. Ooh, okay. What am Harry I Harry Potter? For? Hey, there's a store. Yeah. Can I go to the store first? No, oh. go to the block first because you're going to see something you're going to want to buy. I want to go to the store. You're a wizard, Harry. Okay. Harry wizard? Now you've gone to the blog. You see this print that will be available. Mm-hmm. Harry Potter. Now take a look at that print, Joe. Do you recognize the art style? Yeah, i got to move your... Uh, it's got a lot of lines on it. Type things in front of it. There's an owl. Oops, I clicked the wrong thing. You clicker. <laughs> God. What's it say? Okay, do you have the print up? It does. Do you recognize that art style, Joe? Not really. That is the first non cerebus professional art from Gerhard, oh, yeah? the man who did the um, backgrounds on Cerebus. Maybe the colors is not off. the crazy guy. No. no. He's the guy who did the buildings and the backgrounds and, and all of that. He did the not crazy stuff. Well, he didn't have anything to do with the story. He helped with the art. And he was contracted. This is an official Harry Potter print. The first um, the first non-Cerebus art by Gerhard. And it was, Gerhard was one of these artists who, even when I did not like the story that was going on in Cerebus, which was pretty much about half the run, I would continue to read what they call the phone books because, first off, Sim is brilliant at doing character work, the way he draws facial expressions and movement and things like that, but also the way Gerhardt did backgrounds. He, he, he gave them weight and, 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 and they felt real. They felt photo referenced. Where's my professor's even name print? Uh, but why don't you email him and ask? Because I'm poor. You could still ask. Doesn't mean he's going to do I it. I could do many things. But I really enjoyed this, and I know nothing about Harry Potter, so I don't know if this is a scene from the movies or what. No. But I just, I'm loving Gerhard's art, and I wanted to point out that here's another artist who has kind of left comics. But because of his work in comics, he's able to get work with other bigger companies. And, um, Joe, would you buy it? You're a Harry Potter. I'm not a print type guy. Person. Ah. If I was, I would consider maybe buying that for my daughter. Okay. One other thing I wanted to bring up before we. That we I'm just going through news stuff. Uh-huh. Um, the, 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 with Deadpool becoming so big, there is a lot of people going on and on and on about Rob Liefeld swiping. And because Jen is an artist, I wanted to ask you guys, because I, I, I'm hoping you have very different opinions. Joe, it's Jen, what is your opinion on swiping? And also... Using photo reference, kind of how much is too much? Uh, can you define swiping? Swiping is where you take 
pose well it can be you're using a pose or a layout to where you're almost tracing and there are a lot of artists who learn to draw from kind of oh that's how kirby pose people all draw like that till they found their own style oh, that's not cool. like jim like jim sternanko like um barry windsor smith um when john ramita came over to marvel he was told draw like kirby till you find your own style when he took over spider-man he was he very consciously drew Ditko poses because he didn't want to lose the audience that Spider-Man already had. Now, they eventually all got their own style. Liefeld is kind of well known for using other people's poses all the goddamn time. I don't really know that much about him other than, like, that ridiculous picture of, I guess it's Captain America that keeps getting posted all over the place. <laughs> Yes, Captain America, number one, drawn by and Rob somebody, Liefeld. Somebody, I know somebody at some point tried to draw like, draw like his torso without the costume on. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a couple of some, some ladies that are like hideously deformed, but that's really all I know about that. Anything like, I just him. found out, like, I guess he made this character. Deadpool. Yeah. Well, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> because, well, there are a lot of stories out there about how much input there was into Deadpool's creation. It is credited to Rob Liefeld and Fabian Niasasia. Behind the scenes, the editor who was involved said there was a committee working on this character. Well, you know, it's like to answer your, actually answer your question, like it's not cool to me to like swipe panel layouts or, or swipe poses kind of, you know, let's just trace the guy and draw a different spandex suit on him. But I kind of wonder, since you say this is something that's very prevalent in the industry, like, because one of my main complaints is when I pick up a comic book, I like something that looks unique. I like something that really stands out. And one reason I don't read a lot of comics, like, especially superhero comics, is just, like, these artists are good. I'm not saying they're not talented. Some of them are just amazing. I mean, there's no way I can do this stuff ever. But it doesn't stand out, you know? Like, it looks, you know, it looks like the next book on the shelf. And if you say that, like, you know, this tracing or swiping or whatever is, is so common, I almost wonder, like, you have an entire industry of people that are, in some ways, maybe even not consciously, like, copying each other. And maybe that's why it all looks so samey. I think there's a big part of that. I think one of the things, especially in the 90s, new artists who came into comics learned to draw from looking at comics rather than from drawing from life or, you know, drawing from this. But there's a long history of swipes. If you go back to the Golden Age, you look at a lot of real early comics until like about 42, 43, and you can actually point out, oh, yeah, that's from this Flash Gordon comic strip. That's from this Flash Gordon comic strip. Everybody's stealing from Alex Raymond. Um, or Eisner was doing stuff and people would, would copy him. But there are a lot of artists who begin in the industry copying someone and then find their own style. And I don't know if I've talked to you about this much, Jen. Your influences are more from comic strips. Were there artists that you looked at and said, I want to draw like that? Or did you kind of develop your own style on your own? No, not really. I mean, I had I had comics that I liked and you know, you you sit and you sit and dick around and I would draw you know, I'd draw characters that I liked and try to match it as close to the original as I could, but I was kind of like that was always kind of separate from whatever I was doing my own thing. So, I don't really I mean, you can watch kind of like my style crystallize like at the start of lunch break and I've played with it a lot like over the years, but it's kind of just a mashup of just everything I liked about anything and then stuff I just pulled out of my ass. Like, there's not really there's not really anything in particular that I was like, I, I want to be like this person or that person. Because, I mean, a lot of the artists I really admire, my artwork looks nothing like theirs. I admire their skill and their talent, and I love their work, but their work doesn't look anything like mine. So Now, in the webcomics world, is there a lot of... Um, I know in comics... You know, published comics, there are actually websites and stuff that will point out, this is a swipe from this panel, this is a swipe from this panel. In web comics, is there that sort of, I don't want to call it gotcha stuff, 
but are there people who are kind of yeah 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 you you're just a you're just a swiper no not that i'm really aware of web comics tend to follow like three stripes they either heavily manga influenced heavily like newspaper strip influenced which is kind of where i'm coming from or like heavily regular comic book and sometimes you'll see like the regular comic book and manga style kind of blended um that's really common to see nowadays but i i haven't seen a lot of tracing i've i've seen dumb stuff like where people just literally like cut and paste other people's work and try to recolor it and stuff like that but you're not going to be successful or get very far doing that so i don't i don't think that it's it's as much of a problem i mean you've got sites like 10 i and and i know there's some other reverse image searches where you can actually you know try to source images or, or similar images and I know you asked a little while ago too about like photo references, and you know, I, I don't really, I don't really know that I have a lot of input about that. But I have like a book of naked people that are in poses. If you need help, <laughs> you know, or you got like the little wooden statues you can buy at like the just, art store. Can't but you just Google that. Yeah, I mean, you you know, you know, I sometimes wonder. I mean, you look at some of these comic books, and you're like, were they using like porn as a photo reference? We'll get into that in a little bit. Because some of it, some of it makes you wonder, but, but I, you know, like, I don't really know, like, I don't have a problem with it. I guess it depends on the photo, because, like, I have a book of photos that are literally, like, nudes that are, that are, it's the same pose taken from, like, six different angles. So, because you can't have a live model there all the time, you can, you can kind of, kind of visualize and fill in the gaps and to make that 3D image in your head. So, I mean, is it? Is it if I if I copy that body and then put like a different face and clothes and all kinds of stuff on there? Am I really copying the photo? I mean, that's what it's for. But if you're just like copying stuff from photos wholesale, then yeah, that kind of sucks. You know, draw your I guess draw your Superman from like a still frame from the movie or something. I I'm not familiar. I don't know if anybody actually does that. Now, Joe, back when you had the shop and image became big. I remember when I was in my snarkier moods, I would take a Liefeld book and actually point out, oh, look, this character's actually Cobra Commander, except the mask is a different I'm, color. I'm sorry, Corey. That's when you, you know were, you read too many you were, you were low grade compared to what Mr. Storberg did. <laughs> well, yeah. That, mean, he and I would have fun I, with I, that. I mean, the, the best one was Youngblood 1, where he's, I mean, watch this, he's going to get shot by an arrow, uh, and he goes backwards, and he goes forward, uh, and then he falls <laughs> Dave was the now, only guy to spend three hours in line at the infamous image tent to get Rob Liefeld's <laughs> autograph on a copy of Young Blood One to bring it back to the hotel, set up his camera, videotape him <laughs> ripping it in half and throwing it out the window. To which half of it landed on the floor or on the street where some kid picked it up and goes, Oh cool, a comic book and he went crazy looking for the other half, which it landed on the <laughs> ledge of the hotel two stories above the poor kid and we're all like Dave why don't you just bring it back to the shop and sell it for 20 bucks <coughs> Joe got so worked up he couldn't breathe <laughs> but Joe as a reader does that ever jump out at you where you go I know that pose okay. or I know that drawing Again, or... you don't read early image comics it's, it's a total <laughs> foreign concept so this argument is silly I, I, yep, I've had enough too silly not talking and there are some artists in comics now who've kind of got a reputation for way, way, way using photo reference. And I don't care I'm going to use his name. Greg Land, who for some reason still gets work. What did he do? He does a lot of he, early cover books. Well, he started at CrossGen, and then he came over to Marvel, and he's been working on X-Men books. And he did some work on the Ultimate books as well. And the Ultimate books is where he kind of got in trouble because people started saying, that's a cover-up of porn DVD. Are they sexy X-Men books? Well, supposedly. Well, what was the uh, issue of Doctor Strange where they got in trouble because he aped a cover of Amy Winehouse? Or not a Winehouse. Amy Grant. Amy Grant, yes. It was, that um, is a doc big difference, Joe. Yes, big time. <laughs> well, not to mention Dr. Strange. Those are not remotely the same thing. And, and a mystery magic book, and he's taking some Christian lady and putting her on the cover. 
and what it is, he actually took the photo from the from the album cover and just used her face on this Doctor Strange cover. And there was a while I couldn't read Butch Geis's work because I could actually tell where his photo references were from. It was like, oh, yeah, I read that magazine, and that's where that pose is from. Or I remember that movie poster, and that's where that's from. And I, while I understand using photo reference, I don't mind people who use photo reference. There's one artist who almost exclusively uses photo reference for everything he does. And when I mention his name, Alex Ross. But here's the difference. Alex Ross actually will have someone dress in a suit and put on a hat and take pictures of them in order to paint Clark Kent as Superman. Many of the people he used for his um, photo references became well known because he used them all the time. And I think if you're taking your own photos for photo reference, especially if you're doing painting, I don't see much of a problem with that. It's when you're, oh, I'm just going to take this picture and I'm going to put it into Photoshop and I'll run these filters on it to make it look like a drawing and tweak a couple of things. Up oh, there's my comic panel. I wish it was that easy. For Greg Land, it was for a while till he kind of got in a lot of trouble at Marvel from the rumors are... But I, I think the other thing that has changed back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even into the 70s, comics weren't a, quote, art form. They were a product. It's okay. Get this on the shelf. You've got 30 days to do 24 pages to get it out, and ah, it's done. It's gone. So when people would swipe or you know, copy stuff, it wasn't that big a deal because – you're not doing something for the ages. You're producing product, much like um, canned beans or chicken soup and or you know stuff like that. It's this is product. We got to get it out the door. We got to meet the deadline. But now that comics are considered an art and the stories are used over and over and over again, I think there's a lot more scrutiny on on the artists who do that sort of thing. Uh, see, the, the last big piece of news that I wanted to talk about, Joe, did you hear that Marvel has announced that they are bringing back timely comics? Have their comics not been timely? I is Joe still with us? Eh, whatever. <laughs> did you hear about <clears throat> what timely comics will be? And no, Jen, they haven't been timely. How many, how many months was it between Karnak 1 and Karnak 2? I just Four, five, Karnak? or seven? It's, it's inhuman. Is it a dinosaur? No. Oh, never mind. It's one of the inhumans. Oh, but not a dinosaur. No, oh, not, not a dinosaur. dinosaur. I'm not interested. Uh, maybe I could get you to read Devil Dinosaur. That's right, Jack Kirby did a dinosaur comic. Um, the Timely Comics, Marvel is going to take the first three issues of a number of books and print them as a single comic at three bucks a pop, which is uh, pretty good, except for the fact that they're three ninety nine each. So if you bought the first three issues of, say, Invincible Iron Man, so you spent uh, twelve bucks on that. Oh, look! I could have just waited and bought it for three. Well, they're not going to necessarily do it with every title. And on the plus side, if you did happen to do one of those that they did that, that means your number one probably went up in price a lot. So go ahead and sell it on eBay turn around, buy this $3 comic, and you'll be maybe $9 up. It could work. It could work. Might just be crazy enough. Here are the ones they're doing. They're doing Invincible Iron Man, all new, all different Avengers, all new Inhumans, Carnage, Daredevil, Drax, Doctor Strange, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Jim. Are you, are you making a list of these? Because you know Corey's going to buy them all and give them to you to read. Dinosaurs! Actually, I would probably pick up a couple of these. Um, New Avengers, Scarlet Witch, Squadron Supreme, Totally Awesome Hulk, Ultimates, Uncanny Inhumans, Venom Space Knight, and Web Warriors. Totally Awesome Hulk. I might try the ones yes. that I haven't uh, 
<laughs> Drawn by Frank Cho. I've never read them. I might try I have them. mixed feelings about this. It's drawn by Frank Cho. That's all that matters. Right. I understand that, but it's called Totally Awesome Hulk. There's a reason for that in the story. It's still kind of, you know, very dated, but <laughs> still. I think, much like the dollar books that, that Image and, and, and IDW and Marvel have done, I think this is a good way to get stuff out there. But I also can't look at any of the stuff that Image and IDW and Marvel has done and said, wow, these dollar books have really helped the sales. Joe, as a shop owner, what would you do with these? I'd probably just rack them up with the other dollar books. I would actually have a section in my store, and I, I don't know what to call it, like samplers or something, or, you know, hey, $1 comics, and just make sure if it's available, if it's still being published, that I have it up. You know, sometimes I question, you know, Marvel's done, like, the first issue of Infinity Gauntlet, first issue of Secret Wars, but then they let the actual graphic novel go out of print. Why bother? But if they were to do that, and if it was in support of an ongoing series, I would probably try to keep them, you know, one or two on the shelf. You know, like I said, in a separate section just for people to try. And if the book got canceled, then, well, that's something you throw out on free comic book day or something. Yeah, because I really, as much as I enjoy Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur, I don't see it hitting issue 50. It's okay, dinosaurs. Don't be sad. Yeah. <laughs> you know who's not sad? George Kennedy. He passed away. He, he, he died? Yeah. I didn't even know he was sick. They're not here for you, Frank. Weird Al Yankovic's on the plane. Best <laughs> line ever, except for it's a trap. Why, why Kennedy didn't get the Oscar for that? It's, it's a rigged game, I'm telling you. I mean, I, he did get an Oscar for uh, Cool Hand Luke, but that's neither here nor there. You know who's not neither here nor there? I'm going to fit this in somehow. These guys. guys. Our, Our sponsors. sponsors. Believe it or not, kids, this silliness has actual real sponsors. Our first sponsor is Graze.com. Graze gives you healthy snacks sent to your house you can have them delivered weekly bi-weekly monthly and your first box is free if you use the code c-o-r-y-s-3-r-5-b our second sponsor is bombas bombas socks are some of the best socks in the world and remember for every pair you buy they donate a pair to a homeless shelter or other worthy cause just go to bombas.gotocloud.org slash sf30 that's right. Those are our ads. Go check out our sponsors. And after we talk about our sponsors, we go to Joe and what's on the Ebays. Yeah, we, we've been having... eBay's still uh, around? Yeah. Oddly enough, where eBay kind of shot their foot off trying to be Amazon, which is always ironic because when Amazon tried to do auctions, eBay slaughtered them. It's almost eBay's... like different sites should do different things. Yeah, I mean, chased that's away, just crazy talk. They chased away all the craft people, so they're on what, what is it, Etsy? Am I saying yep. that right? Etsy is amazing. But eBay's still pretty much a three hundred pound gorilla if you're looking for comics in that. Like we talked about the uh, Paleo book. There's a couple of them on eBay, even a few undercover price that you can pick up. For me, the sales have been. They were kind of dry, and then all of a sudden, bam, it was like everybody must have got their tax return or something because I just had a ton of stuff go out all of a sudden. Uh, some of them are books, you know, I don't think we've ever talked about. Like one of them was uh, from Image, Amory Wars. It's a story behind the albums of alternative progressive rock band Coheed and Cambria. And they translated it into a graphic form courtesy of their uh, front man, Claudio Sanchez. It was an image five issue series. I had a couple of them gone. You had your chance. A couple of blank covers went. I had a Wolverine blank cover that sold. Corey, you ever read Jungle Girl? I read a couple. I was not impressed. Yeah, it's written by Frank Cho. 
art by Doug Murray, and of course the nice thing is is that Frank does the covers or did the covers for all of them because this was published. I think the last issue was out 2008. I had one of those risque covers where he drew Jungle Girl with her bare bum. Oddly enough, it sold for 50 bucks. So go figure. So so there are lonely, horny people trolling eBay. Poor Frank. <laughs> this is a theme of this episode, isn't it? It pretty much it's starting to look that way. Corey, what do you I'm know about board. the dark... T- oh, I'm sorry, I did it wrong. Corey, it is time to ask the Strode. Dun, 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 okay. Uh... Corey, All right. what do you know about Dark Tower? Dark Tower was a series of books from Stephen King. Yeah, I know about this thing. They actually started as short stories in the magazine Fantasy and Science Fiction. He then began to collect them in books. Which became, at least the first two volumes became crazily collectible. And I had a hardcover, yes. the third one, that I think I sold for double what I paid for it. And I mean, it was like a 20 or $30 hardcover. Well, they were the first books that King put out limited editions of for a first printing and then would do a mass market for yeah. the regular printing. And by the time that first printing hit, of volumes one and two, nobody was paying attention. And so, of course, those are the ones that are worth some mega bucks. Um, the series, he stopped writing it after a while. And then there was the famous accident where he was hit by a minivan and nearly died, said that he could no longer write because physically he could not sit down at a typewriter anymore. But through physical therapy and other things, he was able to begin writing again. And he was, according to him, he was at the grocery store one day and an older lady came up to him and asked, can you please tell me how the Dark Tower ends? Because I don't, you know, I'm getting older. I don't know how much longer I have to live and I want to know how the story ends. So he actually sat down and wrote the final three books like in a huge rush. And completed them, Aww. wanting to make sure not just that she could read it, but also so that he would not die before they were completed, which is what happened to the infamous Wheel of Time series, and what a lot of people say is going to happen with the uh, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. <laughs> because George R. R. Martin's not getting any younger either, and probably my beloved Berserk. I don't know that series. It's a manga that's been oh, ongoing. The yeah, the manga comic. that's been ongoing forever, and the the author puts out like two chapters a year, so he'll be like 120 by the time the story finishes. One of the things that happened years and years ago is Marvel picked up the rights to do comic adaptations of the Dark Tower books, and they have since done stories that King has suggested that aren't in the Dark Tower books themselves. Um, things that kind of pull the Stephen King universe together, because if you've read the Dark Tower books, you know that all of Stephen King's books are connected, including The Stand, which Marvel did an adaptation of, and a number of like tangentially related miniseries as well. So I know that Marvel a few years ago thought they were done doing it, and they put out an omnibus but they have since gone back and started putting out more because it does so well in bookstores. Does it do well in comic shops? But in bookstores and on Amazon, it sells like like oh, yeah. like crazy. Corey, so Joe, like gangbusters, like hotcakes. I like hotcakes. Hotcakes, Corey, like wheat. Cakes. It's a thing me and Joe can agree on. Tell us about what? Invaders Now. Invaders Now was a weird little mini series. And I believe it was not published by Marvel. Uh, it used the Invaders characters. And it, it was cold, kind of. It, it they they say Marvel did it, but Dynamic Forces probably had no. More. But Dynamite, Dynamite had more in it. It was Dynamite. And Dynamic what Forces it was, had their exclusive variants too. Right. So they got their fingers in there. But Alex Ross came to Marvel and said, "I want to do an Invaders miniseries, but I'm under contract to Dynamite." So they worked out a deal so that Marvel and Dynamite were kind of co-publishers. But I remember at the time, you would read about it in the Marvel, but it would ship from Dynamite. Five issues, a book, a hardcover if you want it. Sold a couple variants of that. 
Now, I'm a big fan of The Invaders, but The Invaders has never, ever sold. The Invaders is Marvel's superhero team during World War II, and it's primarily Captain America and Bucky, the Human Torch and Toro, and the Submariner. Now, what caught my eye on Invaders now was it was a storyline where the Invaders from the past came to the present. Yes. And I forget what was going on in the present. There was an Invader series going on at Marvel at it the was, time. I'm, that I'm didn't, trying to think didn't, Avengers. That didn't do well. Avengers wise, because it tied into current Avengers continuities loosely. Well, there was a movie. there was an Invaders Avengers crossover as well that came from that same partnership. Okay, that might be what I'm thinking of. Corey, what do you know about Doctor Strange 179, Circula 1969? Wasn't that the first issue of? Doctor Strange. Before that, it was Strange Tales. And then when Marvel was able to get their own distribution in the 60s, they were no longer, it was no longer they could only publish eight books a month. So the books where the characters were sharing series, like um, Tales of Suspense was Iron Man and Captain America. Captain America kept the numbering for Tales of Suspense. Iron Man got his own book. Um, Tales to Astonish was Submariner and Hulk. Hulk kept the numbering. Submariner got his own book. Strange Tales was Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Doctor Strange were the two most disparate series Marvel published. Doctor Strange kept the numbering for Strange Tales. Nick Fury got his own book. Was 179 the first? No, that was the one that reprinted the Didco crossover with Spider-Man. Because of the dreaded deadline doom. Okay. I mentioned that because I sold that. Oh. And the last one, of course, we, uh, we I, well, I mentioned the, the other blank cover that I sold was Godzilla Kingdom of the Monsters. Now, this was the retailer incentive variant, which included a, co- a sketch by Eric Powell. And, of course, the various sketches, you could, you could almost tell which ones he probably did towards the end of the run because they weren't <laughs> that great as the ones from the beginning of the run. But this one, My head just broke. And I still got 200 I, more to do. This one I sold on behalf of the Minnesota Comic Book Association, which is having a Comic Con. A what? The MSP Comic Con 2016 is coming. May 14th and 15th, 2016, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Saturday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Sunday in the Minnesota State Grandstand. And as we mentioned before, advanced tickets are on sale at www.mcbacomiccons.com. Over 250 creators will be there, including Including me, the lovely and ultra-talented Jin Wicked. I was just looking over some of the featured guest creators and returning to the Twin Cities, who I don't think he's been here since the Greenberg Con, back when him and Joe Monks were doing Cry for Dawn. Joseph Michael Lindsner will be coming, most well-known for Dawn, and, of course, he's done all sorts of other things as well. A lot of covers and things like that. I see Jen Bartell is coming, an illustrator and a comic artist who specializes in strong ladies. And she's best known for doing uh, Gem in the Hologram, but her work's also been, I don't know, all over the place. Hey, head over to mcbacomiccons.com, get them advanced tickets. Uh, you can see all the featured guests, all the creators that are confirmed now, and as time continues on, They'll be adding more. They have a, a dealer's list, an exhibitor list, and although they're not, we're not listed, we will be there, of course, with bells on, microphones shined, ready to pod the hell out of this con. That sounds kind of kinky, doesn't it? <laughs> this whole episode does. I know. Jen reading dinosaur porn. Kink and comics. <laughs> hey, man. Don't miss out. Consider this your bat signal. MSP Comic Con 2016. Just, just trying to bring in the ratings. Yes. Wait, wait, we've we got ratings? Can somebody please leave an a review on the iTunes saying their favorite part was the dinosaur porn? <laughs> the audio book dinosaur porn. I have obeyed Fangran's command. You will make me very happy. I know we have some super fans out there who who should be doing Come that. On. Come on. Come on, boys. Don't disappoint me. I've been really disappointed a lot in the last year. Don't let me down. And, as Joe has wrapped up his Ebays... Um, How did I become I will... the picture of the YouTube.com? <laughs> <laughs> Is 
is that finally up? <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Did he just now see that? Hi, Jay. Is Corey still talking? I know. Joe is posting selfies while... While Corey's talking, I, should he's I posting selfies apologize for, for everybody on YouTube because they have to look at that for one hour, 36 minutes, and 28 seconds? You know you don't have to stare at the screen the entire time that you're will listening, be right? quite possibly the lowest rated crazy comics and stories ever put on YouTube. But I was wearing pants, so make you feel better about that. Uh, it's it's time for the, the one of the most popular parts of the show. No, it's not when Corey shuts the up. The end? No, no, no. I it's like freaking it and geeking. Music. Oh. <laughs> well, I can stop if you want. <laughs> uh, I like the music. I, I usually listen to it when I'm reading my dinosaur porn. Do you? <laughs> I will now. God. What are you wearing? Well, it's... I can't tell you the color of my pants. Why? I'm not wearing any. <laughs> Freaking and geeking, everybody. <laughs> Whatever. Joe, what are you freaking on? Please, no, for the love of God. Yes. I am having a great time. Jen, what are you freaking on? I ate at White Castle today. I've been here for half a year, and I've avoided it until now. And the other day, somebody was giving me shit for having not been to a White Castle, so I went to White Castle for lunch today, and I ate there. I'm so, so sorry. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, it was terrible. I don't understand. I posted a picture of this food, and everybody's like, well, half the people are like, this is disgusting, and I'm like, totally. And then the other half of the people are like, I'm jealous. Oh, my God. Why would you be jealous of that? Like, I don't even like onions, okay? Onions are one of those things that I, like, super taste, I guess. If I if something has a lot of onion in it, that's, like, all I taste is onion. And sometimes well, that's and okay, and sometimes it's not, but I don't really like the texture of them either. And somehow, somehow, they manage to make onions and pickles have no flavor. Like, this burger was, like, half burger, quote, unquote, was, like, half pickles and onions and it didn't taste like anything and then the fries are like the little like waffly fries like your mom would buy from the freezer section of the grocery store when you're a kid yeah, the crinkle fries crinkle fries yeah i think i can't remember what they were called like in an age where where everybody's like have has this like arms race to have the best french fries and they're like made out of fresh potatoes or they've got like these like crazy batters on them or they're super crunchy or like McDonald's they just have that whatever McDonald's does to their fucking fries that makes them so amazing no white castle is like steadfastly sitting there like fuck this noise i ain't getting involved in this I'm just going to sell you some Orida crinkle cut fries from your local grocer's freezer section. And I was just like, I seriously just wasted like fucking six bucks on this shit. Corey, can I have my freaking back? Yes, you may. I I'm could have eaten good really, food for six bucks. really months. dying for some White Castle right about <laughs> You know what the sad thing is? Whenever I hear White Castle, all I think about is Joe and his goddamn White Castle contest. I was oh. disappointed before I walked in the door because they had like I guess because it's Lent, which is Lent is my favorite time of year because I love fish and like when they ha when Lent happens, like all the fast food places have their fish sandwich. So it's just like this like fish sandwich like, you know, party for an entire month or whatever. But they had like a sign in the window for like a fish sandwich and there was a little box next to it. And when I was driving to the White Castle, like, from far away, the box looked like it had tater tots in it. And I thought, holy shit, there's a place where I can get a fish sandwich and fucking tater tots? Hell yeah. And then when I get there, they turn out to be, like, some, like, minced fish abomination that's, like, battered and deep fried in little tiny chunks because it's too much work to just chew up one big piece of fish. You have to have it, like, pre-cut <laughs> into smaller pieces of fish. So I was disappointed as soon as I walked through the door because I thought they had tater tots and they didn't. So then I was like doubly disappointed by these fucking like frozen crinkle cut fries. And like their little boxes shaped like a castle or something. 
So it's like it's like the saddest thing. It's like a joke. Like if yes. you made this place up in a movie, I wouldn't believe it was real. Mm, so you know, yeah, they made onions taste like nothing, and they have fucking crinkle cut fries, and that was so like. White castles now and pick and the up. crinkle cut fries are soggy. Mine weren't soggy. I mean, they were crispy. They were they were fresh, but they also like took forever. Like the guys working there was like three dudes working there. It's like, is this your all your first day in this like whole place? Because. This is like the saddest food in the saddest place, <laughs> yet you still manage to have oh. a line that's like six people I deep because so you're so hungry. fucking slow. <laughs> America's saddest fast food. America's saddest fast food. Oh, man. Somebody on my Facebook compared this to Taco slider. Bell, and there oh. is like no fucking comparison to Taco Bell. I mean, you just get the fuck out. Like, this is not even in the same league. Taco Bell is like fucking fine dining compared to fucking White Castle. Taco Bell is amazing. Taco Bell is amazing. Like, have you ever had their, like, fucking shredded chicken tacos? I mean, they're not that much different from, like, what I make at home. I mean, I'm sure they find some way to make it, like, terrible and it's going to give me cancer in 10 years or some shit, but it tastes good. It's fresh. The seven, the seven layer burrito is my favorite fast food Dude, item. Dude, I love their fucking bean burritos. They're, they're. Their fajita taco thingies, their whatever, like, like half the menu at Taco Bell is, like, delicious. And you don't have to be drunk or hungover. But I can't, they're like, because, like, you eat White Castle, like, when you're drunk, okay? So why would you eat this when you're drunk unless it's, like, because it has no flavor going down? You're not going to taste anything oh, when it comes man, back up. <laughs> just, I'm dying here. Like, Fortunately, they're open every day what? of the year and 24 hours a day except Christmas. So yeah, I, whatever. As soon as this podcast is over, I will come over. I will leave some on your car. If you were going to fucking eat White be... Castle for your Christmas dinner, mm. could you just chase oh, you it can. down do with do a bullet? Because your life is fucking over. Wow. There is nowhere to go yeah. further, further down than that. I'm telling you. Let's no. Go. Right. There are people, there are people who will buy a huge box of White Castle burgers to make into their their Christmas or Thanksgiving stuffing, and all I can think for those people is how sad it must be to live inside their their brain. Dude, you know, fucking box of stovetop is better than that. Like, you know what? The fucking uh, box the stovetop comes in is better than that. You know, if the people That's what I was going to say. want to send me some free sliders, I am... How do you make I onions have I am taste? drooling. You guys are making me drool. Just stop. You, you know how they do that? Yeah, did you see how they make the burgers? They have this... They, they don't fry the burgers. They don't... They steam them. Steam them. They, they're they, healthy. Get the they spread right out, out the out onions them. on top of a steamer. That's why you guys the don't wasn't even melting. And they put the burgers on top. So, oh, man, I'm dying. as someone who knows Love food, it. It. and Jin can attest that I make fancy food. You may, but when you say close-up of it, eat. it looks like somebody threw up on it. Stop taking such close-up pictures of your food and posting them. Fat is flavor, it and when you like get rid of all the fat it eats, it's You want to know why people like uh, chicken breasts? Because there's no flavor because to them. Because they're chicken boobs. I don't eat that shit. I eat chicken thighs. That's where it's at. Mm. That's right, because there's fat involved. Who's, who, uh, Joe, do, do you want to go back to your freaking? Or, Corey, what are you freaking on? Stop Joe before he starts Oscars, getting excited about hamburgers. Dinosaur porn, hamburgers. What are you freaking on, Corey? Oh, by the way, don't answer the question. White Castles and handle comic books. They do not go together. Don't eat White Castles in anything. Don't eat White Castle, period. Don't listen to these haters. Make Donald uh, Trump again. I looked at my comic order last month. Oh. I mostly just get, you know, hardcovers and 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 um, reprint stuff, everything else I'm doing digital. My comic order last month was very nice, very small. I, I'm looking now. Marvel has one, two, three, four, five, six... Seven, eight, nine, nine different omnibuses for sale. Omnibuses. Um, Fantagraphics. I haven't ordered anything from them for a while. I, I it, let, let me pull the Fantagraphics order up that I have here. 
Um, let's see. We've got uh, we've got the last volume of Peanuts, except they say there will be another volume of mysterious stuff that they won't tell us about yet. By the way, um, the person writing the introduction for the final volume of Peanuts is President Barack Obama. Yay! That was an interesting uh, get. But over at Fanagraphics, you've got the complete Peanuts, you've got uh, Barnaby Volume 3, you've got all this expensive stuff. My comic order for for next month is going to cost more than a small car. By the way, I've folks, if you want to help me out, go to my eBay site, Crazy, and buy some stuff, because I, I will con I will not I will, uh, yeah, second what Corey said. I have no clue how we're going to do it. I mean, two omnibuses, tons of decent hardcover collections. They're reoffering the Ben Edlin Tick, the complete one with his pseudo issue 13, how he's going to end the bloody series. And, you know, I've been cutting back comics that are kind of meh. But, man, they got some good stuff coming. And for months, it's been almost a desert. It's like, oh, okay, um, well, let's see, comics coming out in May. Yeah, you don't need that money. No. Fuck you. We're taking it all. Every um, single quarter. We are now in week two of the uh, Prime and the Pump for Rebirth. We still have no creative teams. And if you look through your previews... You said Prime and the Pump. I know. We're just getting so bad. It's like he doesn't even try to get rid of the explicit logo. I, I gave up when Jin when Jin joined the show. I'm looking That's at all these. Me to say. I, I've, I'm looking Hello. at all these 52s that are supposed to be the end of the series. There's no notice, no notice at all that this is a last issue. No notice at all that this is. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have my rant right here. One of the big problems with the new 52 going into it, according to everybody who worked on them, was that it had to be pulled together at the last minute. They did what they called bake-offs, which is they went to different creators and said, if we were to give you, say, Catwoman, Catwoman. A, with a blank slate, not as cute when I do it. what would you do? And they had four or five Catwoman. creators send, there you go. <laughs> send in pitches, and they picked the best one. The stories coming out of Rebirth, some of the creators are being told it is a reboot. Some of the creators are told it's not a reboot and they're to use old continuity. Some of the creators are told that it's going to be all new continuity. Some of the no, it, it, again, we're going to go into this supposed fixing of everything, and it's going to be a mess. Now I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong, but that would mean that all the creators are either lying to the people interviewing them or they're being lied to by the editors. It's already sounding like a clusterfuck. DC, we need you to sell good books. As your sales go down, nothing is picking up, and shops need to make their money, man. Don't blow it. Geeking. Joe, what are you geeking on? I'm geeking on lots of stuff. The aforementioned DC actually has a couple number ones. Mostly they're, I guess I'm going to call it the, I can either call it the Jim Lee universe or the Hanna-Barbera universe. But the first one is Scooby Apocalypse number one. And while I'm not really digging the, the super remake, it's Jim Lee and Keith Giffen. So I will definitely be checking that out. And then the Future Quest is coming out. That's the big crossover with uh, most of the other Anna Barbera characters, and I will check that one out as well because you know me, I love a decent crossover. Uh, Joe, did you see who's doing some of the variant covers for that? Uh, yeah, and I probably am just. I, I really got unless I can find them cheap, and I'll, I'll do my theory. Wait a year, they'll be on eBay cheap. I don't think I can afford to go in these uh, variant covers here. There, there's going to be a Steve Rude Space uh, Ghost. No, no, he's doing Johnny Quest. No, he's doing Don Johnny Quest. He'll, Bill Sienkiewicz oh. is doing Space Ghost. I know. Now, the writer on this is Jeff Parker, who did the amazing series at Marvel, Agents of Atlas, one of my favorite comics of the last ten years. I'm excited about this one. The Scooby-Doo thing, we've, we, I've gone over it repeatedly in the past. I fucking hate Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo. Aren't you going to sing, Joe? 
Nah, 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 you scared nah, 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 out of them? That was weird. It was. Uh, Jim, what are you geeking on? I'm not done yet. Oh, okay. Jeez, I thought I got, you were done no, with you just, the sing- You just rudely jumped in and, and started telling us about, uh, you know, your vast comic I was geeking that Joe was done, but I guess yeah, I got excited for nothing. I got, I got <laughs> We all get excited well, here, with here's jokes. Where, here's we where all I get send Jen off to another drink because I'm going to start geeking on a Star Wars book I read. Oh, God damn there it. she goes. Star Wars Tarkin by James Cena. This is uh, one of the. This one actually went a quite a long ways of answering my question because as you start thinking about the whole Star Wars trilogy, and I, I'm not counting the. Well, I suppose you can count the prequels too. How the hell did Tarkin get in the position where he commanded Darth Vader, especially the way Vader was such a badass in the other, you know, five movies? This book goes a long way into filling that gap. It also talks about why Tarkin would just, you know what, let's blow up a fucking planet today because, you know, Leia pisses me off. So it, And it is tied into the continuity. In the front of the book, they actually give the new continuity in which books are part of it. So... I picked up a paperback cheap on eBay, so if you want, if you want it, give me a quick call because now it's just back in my accumulation of crap. <clears throat> I download our podcast twice now, once because I archive it so I can listen to it later, but I also did it at work while I was on my mobile phone, so I was able to download it off. Uh, dra- I think I took it directly from our website, and then I was able to actually listen to our last podcast which is actually kind of fun because, I mean, it was so great when we're just ragging on Corey. I just, and it's, it's sad because I'm sitting there in a quiet room and I'm laughing my ass off. and You know, people are looking at me even stranger than I normally am. So, so that was kind of fun, being able to download the podcast. I am geeking on the return of the small cons because there are several that are coming out. Last weekend there was one... Blizzard Con, which I wasn't able to go to because uh, I had to work. And I'm just trying to get it to... Ah, of course, the link won't come up. Link fixed. Yeah. That's okay, though. I'll be getting my new computer pretty soon, so hopefully that will... Uh... Hang on a second. Let me try to get it. do 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 Please ah, stop singing now. Never mind, it's not going to come up. But anyways, there was uh, it was just a there was a guy online, Matt's Rad Show, and what he did is he went into the con and he basically ran a, a running podcast or YouTube video or whatever, and he just kind of talked to the different creators, the different people online, get a feel for what it is. Essentially, it was almost like there was a a school in a shopping center. And inside this school, they took a room and they ran this con. And so it was really kind of cool. I Again, I wish I could have gone, but I, I kind of dig that these little cons are coming back. The other one, of course, that we've talked about in the past is the guys that do the comic card show. The, yeah, I'm going to uh, try to go to that. Yeah, the next one's April 16th, 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And if you go to comiccard.net, You'll be able to read all about it. Al Snow's going to be there, Corey, if you want a little head. <laughs> got Eric Burnham there, comic relator. Otis Frampton, who does Oddly Normal and did some Ghostbusters as well. Larry Hama will be there, which would be kind of cool. And uh, then there are some other sports guys. Corey Koski, who I guess is a twin. I, I really don't know. Uh, it's, it was the last couple times I've gone. It's been a lot of fun. I wasn't able to get to the last one. I was all excited to go see Eric Larson, creator, Dra- Savage Dragon creator. But then I ended up losing my voice, which made me, as my wife called it, almost the perfect male. Oh, God. Now, almost? Almost. What's well, perfect? If I would just leave perfect, please, she would be more excited. She loved it when Joe was in, in uh, Barrow, Alaska. Oh, yeah. Kind of farther. It didn't matter where I was, just so she was away. Well, more importantly, if I was somewhere, she wanted to go. Because, like, when I was in New York, she didn't want to come because she'd been to New York. When I was in Vegas, she didn't want to come. When I was in Colorado, she came. When I was in Washington, D.C., she came twice. So, 
and she did try to get the barrel. It was just you can get the Anchorage cheap. But trying to get the barrel very expensive. I mentioned because all the vampires the Blizzard Con because it was put on by the guys at High Class Comics, and of course they just moved from 377th East 48th Street to right down the, the street from me at uh, on Earl Street here. Hang on a second, again my. Oh, I can't wait till I get my new new computer. 371 Earl Street in St. Paul. So I could almost visit them every day if I wanted to. Uh, their store is set up. It's really cool. It's uh, in the Dayton's Bluff area, just an old building. They've got it filled pretty good. And I know he's got way more stuff because it's not even half the stuff he's had at conventions put there. And, of course, he's buying, selling comic books, video games, action figures. Not doing new stuff, though which is real interesting. And he, his old store, I, I never got a chance to talk to him why he moved, but apparently it's, it's just space. He's a much nicer neighborhood, I think. I, I, you know, I don't know, but it'll be kind of cool. I stopped by earlier today, picked up a couple of comics, uh, brought my daughter down there, and I think I might actually stop by again. I, I don't know when the podcast drop, but uh, I know they're doing a sale for their first week open. I think by the time this drops, the sale will be over, but you know, maybe mention it. You heard it on our podcast here, and maybe uh, I don't know. He might he might float us something. Comic wise, I I read a few things. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go over the number ones. I read number one Wyatt. I'm sorry, Winona Earp from Bo Smith, Laura Innes, and Jay Photos. IDW. It's a mini series. It's also a sci-fi show. I picked up the photo cover. They do a good cool. job of reintroducing the character. She's essentially a uh, U.S. Marshal who's tasked with hunting down paranormal fugitives without being devoured, devoured by the same people. I read the first issue of a crossover that I probably will not be picking up. When I first picked it up, I was all gung-ho on doing it, and then I decided when I saw what was crossing over, I wasn't going to. But Avengers 1 standoff, Welcome to Pleasant Hill. And I don't know if you want to throw out a... Actually, I'm not going to say much about it. Maybe I'll talk about it a little bit more next time, let people get a chance to actually read it. But it is part of a crossover. I don't think I'm going to buy any of the crossover. In fact, I used it as a jumping-off point for several issues, and I don't think I'm going to be jumping back on. I will maybe buy this as a graphic novel, or maybe wait till it's on Marvel Unlimited. But I thought the premise was kind of interesting. Not enough to make me go into all these issues that I'm not buying normally. Picked up some of those $1 one-shots we talked about. I read The Death Defying Dr. Mirage. A little confusing, trying to figure out what's going on. The art wasn't always clear as the character. Plus, I went in thinking Dr. Mirage was a guy, as he was in the previous, as in it's a female. But essentially, Dr. Mirage in the Valiant Universe is Dr. Strange in ours. And realizing that, it actually seemed kind of fun, and it was a good issue to read. I read a book called Div- Divinity, and it's, uh, I don't know how else to explain it. It's, I guess, when Earth is about to meet a new god, and I actually enjoyed it. I, again, these are a couple series. I, I'm not really looking to add new series on my list, but I will definitely be looking for them maybe at the upcoming cons we talked about, maybe as a mini series. And I picked up, just for the hell of it, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Greatest Hits number 1 from IDW. This, as I was talking about, not only has the first issue of IDW, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which is sort of an origin story. So even if if you're looking to just jump on and have some fun with it, it's a good issue to start with. But it also has a timeline for IDW and tells you what order to read the various stuff, the one-shots. And, of course, they have a crossover where they... Uh, they meet the Ghostbusters, and and I I don't know where the Batman one fits into it, but for just a one-shot, it gave me an interesting taste of the Turtles. Not my cup of tea, but again, if you did like them, it's worth picking up. And one thing interesting when we order through discount comic book services is when they discount old issues, and I'm always fun to pick up a few of them, especially when they're doing them cheap. I picked up one called Drum Heller from Image. It's out of their Shadow Line issue 10, I read it. The art's good. The characters are easy to tell 
who's talking and who is, did not know what the F was going on. And being as it was the actual last issue of the series, probably why they were discounting it. But it made me wonder, and we've talked about this before, would it have killed you to put a synopsis on the front to kind of catch me up to speed? Much as I enjoyed the art and I enjoyed the confusion of what was going on, I don't think I would go out of my way to buy the graphic novel or look at it just by sampling this. But if I had a, had a feeling as to what was going on, or if I find them in the quarter box, maybe. And I did pick up, I don't know what the hell you called it. It's uh, All New Art, number 20, the, the Didco book. Corey, explain to, me, oh, yeah. explain to me what's going on with this. Um, what Steve Ditko is doing is he is continuing to do, well, you could call them comics, but really they're illustrated essays. Now, I have not seen this all-new art book that you're talking about, but his work for the past 10, 15 years has been him doing essays about his philosophy, how he sees art, how he sees society. Um, he will talk at times about why he left Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Um, how he feels about working at different corporations. And one of the things to remember about Ditko is when he read Ayn Rand's books, he became a very, very staunch objectivist. And while a lot of people go with the Ayn Rand as selfish, basically allowing teenage boys to underpin their selfishness by saying, no, it's not me being an asshole, it's a philosophy. I'm a captain of industry. Right. Fuck you, I've got mine. <laughs> Ditko is more about how there are no, when you really get down to it, there are no shades of gray. There is right and there is wrong. And when he signs a contract with someone, he will do exactly what is in the contract. He will fulfill that contract. He, back in the 80s, he worked on mostly kids' books because he didn't like the moral ambiguity that Marvel Comics had in most of their books. He wanted the heroes to be heroes and the villains to be villains. And while I've not seen this book, I know that in his other books, it's very much essays about, and it's a logical fallacy, but Dicko almost worships it, how anything becomes a slippery slope. And while I... While I disagree with Ditko, I still find his stuff very fascinating because he explores his philosophy in great detail. Yeah, this was kind of interesting because uh, I guess it, it's, it says number 20, published by Rob Schneider and Steve Ditko. No other uh, copyright acknowledgement on it. It's pretty much, it's comic book size. It ran about four bucks. They say, coming soon, coming attraction, issue 21. And it's, it's a few of the stories I guess I could understand, a few of them I didn't. Uh, one of them was actually kind of interesting on the back, the outline. Uh, I really enjoyed the one that I thought was uh, funny called the New Antihero Comic Books Transform Us. <laughs> and uh, I'm surprised you didn't get it in your box today, but I don't know if you picked these up. I usually pick them up when I see them. Yeah, this one was actually in one of the previews, and I don't ever recall seeing it before. Maybe this was just Diamond trying it for an issue or something. I don't know. A lot of this it also comes out randomly, and the reason it's issue 20 is because he counts his self-published stuff, the stuff that was published by Pacific, the stuff that was published by Dark Horse, as part of this series. Okay, yeah, because it was... I, I mean, it just caught my eye that it was Tidco. And I thought, okay, this might be kind of fun. Plus, I knew if I didn't know what the hell was going on, I'd get you home and say, Corey, translate this for me. <laughs> so, that's all I'm geeking on. And I, like I said, I'm more geeking this week than freaking. So I was geeking on that, too. Jen, what are you geeking on? Uh, well, I've been getting out lately. Uh, White Corey Castle, wanted that? to ask me about. Yeah, not White Castle. Fuck White Castle. I went, uh, I stopped by last Saturday uh, at a meet and greet at the Source, so it was my first time being to the Source uh, comic shop. Unfortunately, my schedule is conspiring against me, and I've been kind of 
been burning it at both ends lately, so I'm pretty burnt out. I could not get out of bed Saturday morning, uh, and I had somewhere I had to be, so I only stopped by for about 20 minutes, but I did get to say hello to a couple people I, I wanted to see, and a few people talked to me, and I didn't know who they were, and I had wanted to make cookies, and I didn't have time for that, unfortunately. Uh, I also am trying to catch a mouse in my kitchen, so I'm not really comfortable making food for other people right now, but... But that was awesome, and I'm looking forward to getting out more, uh, some of the comic shops around town, uh, meeting with other artists. Corey and I went to, I didn't mention last week, Corey and I went to Third Thursday at the Art Institute. Is that right? Yep. And so we looked at some awesome paintings, and, you know, I I felt really inspired walking around, especially the contemporary art exhibits, and, you know, so tired. I felt inspired and promptly fell asleep as soon as I got home, <laughs> rather than, you know, furiously staying up all night painting like I might have. But I'll also be at the Pancakes and Booze art show on April 9th. That is, you can, I can't tell you the location, it's Skyloft Theater, Skyway Theater, something. Skyway Sky, Theater. Skyloft is the Legend of Zelda game. Skyway <laughs> Theater is the place where the art show will be. Um, so I'll be there. I, I have done, you know, the comic. I've done the Spring Con and Fall Con here, but it's going to be my first actual art show here where we're focusing on the painting, though I will have many comics for sale. Um, so I've been cranking out some Happy Rat paintings in anticipation for that. And it is also highly likely I will be introducing another one of my artist friends who this will also be his first show. I'm kind of dragging him out with me. I need new show. I need new show buddies here. I need new show partners here. Uh, Josh Lesnick will be with me at SpringCon. He's my con buddy, but uh, I need an art buddy, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm excited. So I will have more information about that. Um, start promoting it on my Facebook page if you're not already following me on Facebook and Twitter and all that fun stuff. So I'm excited. I'm tired. Mostly tired. That's it. Corey, what are you freaking on? I mean, geeking on. I'm so tired I can't even keep this straight. Um, while I may complain that Marvel's putting out a bunch of new omnibuses, I'm also excited because I really love the format. It's cool that I'm going to get a second volume of Master of Kung Fu that will be so big I can stun a horse with it. In my box day, I got the latest um, volume of the Creepy reprints. These are archived, they're magazine size, and it reprints Creepy Magazine. They're up to the mid-70s now. So these are the issues that were edited by Louise Jones, who then married Walt Simonson, became Louise Simonson. So it's when Creepy was on an upswing quality-wise, and some of the art in it is just amazing. There's some beautiful Alex Nino art that I just... I, I'll be looking through and it's you just kind of stop and you stare at the pages. If you have not seen any, any Alex Nino art, go out of your way to find some of his work. It is like nothing you've seen before. His design sense, his 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 inking is it's absolutely beautiful. And while I liked his stuff when he worked for DC, his stuff in black and white is a hundred times better. I've also seen some of his stuff in the Marvel magazines at the time. And he's one of those artists I wish was still putting out work because I would buy it. And I would buy multiple copies and give it to people I know to say, you must look at this. Me? Yes. Uh. Um, the other book that I got that I'm very happy for, and I put it up on the Instagrams, because when I get my box day, I take pictures of the stuff that I really like and put up on the Instagrams. I got the omnibus for the Sinister Foes of Spider-Man. I don't want Dana to know what's out. I want to read Are it you going to talk about the claims. bowl of bugles that you posted on your Instagram? I can later, but I'm going to talk right now about the um, Superior Foes of Spider-Man, which is written... the bugles. I would, too. Just because I don't which want is... my daughter Dana to know that that book's out, because I want to read it first, because I she let me sell her two trades knowing that they would probably never be, you know, a, a second and third one, and I bought the Omnibus instead. <laughs> and the third one did come out, by the way, in February yeah, of 2015. I figured the Omnibus would be a better way to do it. Yes, the Omnibus is better. The Omnibus also has artist, it has artist commentary for the last issue, 
which I love. I wish more. I wish more of these collections would do stuff like that. You've got the room. You've got the pages. Do it. It's written by Nick Spencer, who's currently writing the Ant-Man series at Marvel, which I absolutely adore. He's also writing Sam Wilson, Captain America, which I'm kind of iffy on. But Superior Foes of Spider-Man is about the loser villains that Spider-Man has beat the crap out of for years and years and years, coming together as a team. It's drawn by Steve Lieber, who does not do superhero books. And it's beautiful. It's in that Chris Samney, that, uh, that Chris Samney style of simplistic, heavily inked art that is more mood than anatomy. Um, the story is fun and funny. You really get to know the, the villains. And... They're lovable losers, and they're trying to put together these schemes to, to kind of redeem themselves. And it's just so much fun to read. And that's one of the things about comics that I, I, I really want, and I've always talked about, it, while it's good to read the really dramatic stuff, I want my comics to be fun. And whenever a comic is fun, I'm going to read it more than once. So, Superior Foes of Spider-Man, if you have not read it, go pick it up. Also, if you are not reading The Astonishing Ant-Man, it is a spiritual sequel to that book. Because it's Ant-Man putting together a detective agency with a bunch of loser villains trying to turn their lives around. It's really good stuff. And then the last thing that came out of my box day that I enjoyed was the 100th issue, and as you read through it, it's very clear that the publisher thought this was the last issue, of a magazine called Scary Monsters. The cover is a gorgeous painting by Scary T Terry Beatty, who's longtime uh, Minneapolis, he lived in the Quad Cities, moved to Minneapolis, was at the convention for years. I saw him at Rockabilly shows. He recently moved to Kansas City. But it's a beautiful painting of all the old monsters that you used to watch on the Creature Show. And the magazine itself is just memories of people watching monster movies as kids. So it's not something you're going to read and go, this is as good as an Alan Moore comic or a David Foster Wallace novel. No, it's wallowing in nostalgia, and there's nothing wrong with wallowing in nostalgia every once in a while. And since you guys brought up the Bugles, I have not had Bugles in forever, and they put them in the vending machine at work. And I try not to use the vending machine at work because I'm still losing weight. You're worried it might and, fall on you and kill you. Well, that too. But I saw Bugles, and I had not had Bugles in forever. And oh my God, they are so... They're, they're just full of chemical Did goodness. Did you put them on your fingers and pretend they were claws? No. Did you? I put them for. in. Have you? I, I did. I put some on my teeth and pretended I was a vampire, though. Okay, a that's Corn good. vampire. <laughs> that's a right. Corn actually vampire. In Minnesota. <laughs> and the other horrible food for me that I have purchased. MidwestAmerica.jpg. Do, do you know what time of year it is, Joe? It is the greatest time of year. Shamrock shake time. Shamrock shakes are Already back. Had mine. Oh, I saw one of those on the menu the other day. <laughs> and and it's funny because I had one. I, I picked it up and went to work at the group home. And one of the people said, a shamrock shake. Now, what does it taste like? And I said, chemicals. Does it taste like mint or no? A little, kind of, but there's so much sugar. I don't really like mint. You, then you won't like it. It's sugar and a little bit of mint and chemicals. Lots and lots of chemicals. It's chemically. And I only have one or two because, oh my, what is it, 42 teaspoons of sugar in a large? It's, it's minty in the way that carrots aren't. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one of those things that while you're eating it, you like it, and then when you're done, you regret it for days. It's like, oh, my God, it was so terrible, and my stomach kind of hurts because it's so much sugar. And, well, I need another one in a week or so. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, and now I've had enough junk food, so I have to go back to, to, um, to the happy snacks that I get from, from our sponsor, Gray's. So, um 
the, there, there. I talked about the bugles. Are you happy now? I wasn't listening. Not remotely. I like bugles. They're delicious. Yeah, you still. Have, I still need to get you that monster bag of the um, TGI Friday's potato skins. You do? Uh, yeah, because our first time she went to um, Menards. Oh yeah. There was this huge bag of what it was. Um, TGI Friday's cheddar bacon potato skins. Menards is a magical place. And the bag was as big as your torso. Yeah, pretty much. And she kept going back to it. Oh, I should. Oh no, I won't get these. Oh, I should get. No, I, I won't, won't get, get them because I will fucking sit there and eat them all in like one sitting. But when those zombies they, attack, you wish you were there. But they have smaller bags. They do. And maybe I could parcel them out. Whatever. And I also I have certain things for your birthday that I could not mail. So. Ooh, more presents. No, usually yes. hazmat. Oh yeah, it was my birthday. Like, since the last time we recorded. And people should have sent you gifts, and they didn't. How dare they? No, How dare I got, they? No, I got a gift from you. I got a gift from um, a friend here. And I got a gift from uh, my ex-mother-in-law, which is very sweet. Well, believe it or not, kids, <laughs> you can listen to us blather on about hmm. funny books for over an hour and a half. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you uh, like the most. Joe? To do is to be. I chiz. To be Pizza. is to do. Can't. Do be. Do be do. Sinatra. Jin? As she makes her decisive move with delicate precision, her intoxicating musk fills his nostrils and mouth. <laughs> Hit my music, boys.